Hello and welcome. We're pleased to have people joining us from all over the world to take part in a conversation, a conversation about how the International Progressive MS Alliance is fueling research to develop life-changing treatments for progressive MS. We'll discuss over the next 30 minutes or so how cutting edge research is revealing new disease modifying treatment targets for people with progressive MS. My name is Bruce Bebo and I'm joining you from Portland, Oregon in the United States. I'm the executive vice president of research at the US National MS Society. And I'm also an Alliance scientific staff member that helps advance the work of the International Progressive MS Alliance. I've worked in MS research for over 30 years in academic, in industry, and in nonprofit organizations. And like many of you on this call, my connection to MS is personal. I was inspired to join the MS movement by my mother who lived with progressive MS. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment and recognize the generous support of our sponsors for today's webcasts, Sanofi Genzyme and Genentech, a member of the Roche Group. Thank you for helping make this webcast possible. The International Progressive MS Alliance is an unprecedented global collaboration with a singular focus on finding new effective and safe treatments for progressive forms of MS. It includes 19 MS organizations, hundreds, probably thousands of researchers, healthcare professionals, the pharmaceutical industry and other kinds of companies, foundations, donors, and of course, people affected by progressive MS. In short, the Alliance has brought the world together to solve progressive MS. And to date, the Alliance has invested over 24 million euros in research with an overall commitment of the members of the Alliance of 60 million euros through the end of uh, 2025. If you're watching this webcast, you likely know that ending progressive multiple sclerosis is an urgent and unmet need. Prior to this webcast, we received questions and comments from hundreds of individuals from throughout the world regarding treatments for progressive MS. People from India and Australia Morocco, Norway, Canada, and 20 other countries have shared their hopes and their concerns. We've tried to incorporate as many of these questions as we could into our discussions today. Um, in future webcasts, we'll work to include additional topics and questions that, that you shared with us. So with that being said, let's get started. With me today are some of the world's leading MS experts who are working to find life-changing solutions. First, I'd like to introduce Professor Francisco Quintana. Uh, Dr. Quintana is a professor of neurology at the Center for Neurologic Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Harvard Medical School, and is, and is an associate member at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. And Dr. Quintana's research is focused on signaling pathways that control central nervous system damaging immune responses with the ultimate goal of identifying novel therapeutic targets and biomarkers for disorders like MS. Professor Quintana and his collaborators and, and, and lab have published over 140 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and he's the winner of the prestigious Barancic Prize, among many other honors. In addition, his research has resulted in multiple patents, which have now been the foundation of three different companies. Uh, Dr. Quintana is also the lead researcher in an Alliance-funded global collaborative research network focused on identifying drug candidates for treating progressive MS. And his team includes researchers from the United States, Canada, Israel, and also from the company Sanofi Genzyme. I'm also uh, pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Lily San Marco. Uh, Dr. San Marco is a postdoctoral fellow in uh, Dr. Quintana's lab and is focused on, on projects uh, supporting the Collaborative Network Project. She completed her doctorate in biochemistry at the National University of Cordoba in Argentina. And she re researches how to stop inflammation in MS with a particular focus on the bacteria in our, our digestive system. Sometimes we've heard of this as known as the gut microbiome. So she's gonna tell us a little bit about this in a few minutes. And how this gut microbiome or bacteria in our digestive system influences immune pathways that contribute to MS. 
And also joining us today is Dr. Michael Wheeler. Uh, he's a, also a postdoctor fellow that works in Dr. Quintana's group. And his work is focused on the interactions between the immune system and the central nervous system in MS. And his research has identified environmental, genetic, and microbial interactions that control astrocyte responses in the central nervous system. So he's gonna tell us a little bit what astrocytes are, and we'll learn a little bit more about what he's, um, what he's doing um, uh, later on today. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, uh, you're, you're really all doing really very interesting, exciting research. But I, before we kind of dive in and geek out, if you will, Let's, let's get to know you guys just a little bit. So um, I, I'm gonna start with you, uh, Dr. Quintana, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know, you know, what inspired you to pursue research in, in MS? So um, my, grand, my granddad, my grandpa, was uh, uh, one of the role models in my family. And then uh, because of neurologic disease, I saw him going into, you know, from this towering person into uh, being bedridden and actually out of there. So for me, that's my, that's the strong motivation behind it. Thanks for sharing that, Fran. I, I think it's interesting to learn how a lot of people have personal stories that sort of inspired them um, to, to, to work and where, where they are. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, uh, Dr. San Marco, what, what got you interested in MS research? Well, it started some years back while I was doing my PhD. My dad got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And I was like interested in learning how the immune system could act on these neurological diseases. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, and, and I think this will may come out a little bit later, but there are a lot of some parallels between other neurodegenerative diseases and some of the pathways you all are studying and MS and other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So um, th thanks for sharing that. Uh, Dr. Wheeler, can you tell us what, what got you started in MS research? Yeah, so um, similar to what you said, I was very excited about the uh, science behind um, potentially solving MS and how it requires the integration of expertise of uh, immunology and neuroscience uh, in order to develop these new treatments. So that's, that's what got me interested. Very cool. Yeah, I think that's what hooks a lot of people. Uh, uh, there's a lot of a lot of challenging, interesting, but now I think achievable questions that we can answer in progressive MS, which is a, a draw, I think, for a lot of people in, in the field. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, it, it's always interesting. It's always inspiring to find out how people got involved in the MS uh, movement. And so thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, so, so let's set, set the stage for today's discuss, discussion. So, so the leading concept for what's driving MS is that there are probably two biological processes that are proceeding in parallel to each other. So the first process involves immune cells that arise from outside the nervous system and for reasons that we still don't really fully understand, recognize myelin, the myelin sheet that insulates nerve cells as being dangerous for some reason and attacks it. And these attacks come and go and they're the primary driver for relapsing remitting MS. And then, and then the second process involves more of a gradual destruction of the nervous system and the cells and the tissues of the nervous system. And this causes um, is known as neurodegeneration and it's not really well understood, but it's likely related partly to the destruction of myelin. Um, it's related to the activation of cells that reside within the central nervous system and release of factors uh, by these cells that are damaging to the nervous system. And these are the processes that are thought to drive the more insidious progression uh, of MS. And these processes are, are occurring in parallel. And, it, and the form of MS that you live with probably depends on which one of these processes is predominating at any particular time. So on the inflammatory relapsing aspects of MS, we've done a pretty good job of developing treatments over the last, what now, about 30 years. So we have about 20 disease modifying therapies that have been shown to slow or modify relapses, reduce inflammation, and really change the landscape for people living with relapsing remitting uh, MS dramatically. But as we all know, um, for the most part, treatments that are effective in addressing this other pathway, the pathway that drives progressive MS, have been slower to develop. And we don't 
have a real good scientific understanding of the biology of progression, which is what has sort of made it hard to know where to focus on for developing treatments. So, but that's the reason why we don't have as many effective treatments for progressive MS as we have for relapsing MS. And this is really the inspiration, these challenges around progressive MS what really inspired us to start the International Progressive MS Alliance. And we could see that the research community was gonna to have to work in different ways and new ways if we were gonna uh, tackle and solve this problem. And we needed everybody at the table. We needed the researchers, the MS organizations, the pharmaceutical companies, people affected by progressive MS, all the stakeholders at the table. And it's also what prompted the development of the Global Collaborative Research Network uh, uh, funding opportunity, the, the grants that, uh, that, that Dr. Quintana and his lab have. And so we, we, we wanted to not just understand progression, but also develop and find innovative treatments that could help people with progressive MS live better lives. So I'm gonna start with you, uh, Dr. Quintana, you're focused on the innate immune system and people with progressive MS. So I think we might wanna help people understand and define what the innate immune system is and then why, why is that an area that we're focused on uh, for progressive MS? So I think that's, that's a great question. So in the context of progressive MS, right, when we, when we talk about the innate immune system, we're talking about those cells that, as you were saying, you know, they sit in the brain, they sit in the CNS, right? And they drive this chronic inflammation. These are not the cells that are coming from the periphery. These are cells that are in there. And the reason we're focusing on those cells is because the, as you mentioned, we have several therapies pretty good to control those cells coming from the periphery into the CNS. Yet we still don't really understand what controls those cells, those innate cells, that innate inflammation driven by cells that sit within the CNS. We do not know really what controls them. And then we really need drugs that can dampen that different type of inflammation as a way of having what we believe would be promising therapies for progressive remedies. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, and in contrast to the adaptive immune system, which are those cells that uh, have receptors, if you will, for specific antigens, the innate immune system are more ancient part of our immune system, a part of our immune system that's shared by a lot of other organisms that helps us normally helps us fight uh, early sort of early stages of fighting infections rather than the later stages. But in, in the case of progressive MS, I think Fran, it's a, it's a bit mixed, right? I mean, the innate immune system in some ways is helping clear the damage, but in other ways it's contributing to the damage as well. I think that's been part of the challenge in studying these pathways. And, and that's an excellent question. And that's one of the things we've been trying to do, right? Like, you know, they were all kind of like, they, what we needed was some kind of, uh, to take a deeper look, right? To try to separate those elements, those elements that could be beneficial for the disease, right? Yeah. Because they would potentially help repair, they would potentially help limit inflammation. And also we needed to identify uh, elements in, the, in that innate response that were actually fueling driving inflammation. And that's part of what we've been doing through our work with the Alliance, literally putting together lots of uh, really cutting edge uh, genomic techniques to really be able to differentiate what would be the good and bad elements within the innate response, then to identify what controls them and how to, uh, and how to control them therapeutically. Yeah, thanks. It, it, and that's, that's great. Uh, and, and so can you tell us, I mean, that's the focus of the work that you are uh, funded to perform with the, through the Global Collaborative Network study. It relates to a lot of the work that you're doing in your lab. Can you share with the audience, you know, what, what progress you've made over the last few years? So I could, I could summarize the progress we've made into three areas. First of all, as I was saying, we were able to really tease apart, right? like to really identify those different elements within the innate immune response, right? The beneficial and pathogenic elements that are relevant for progressive events. That's point number one. The second thing we were able to do was actually to go over drugs uh, that are known, right? and identify one drug, this is what we call, uh, usually we, we refer to as repurposing. We identify a drug that is already in use in humans that could potentially, for, for the treatment of other disease, right? That we believe because of its activities, right? And its ability to dampen 
the pathogenic activities of the innate response that you were referring to. We believe this is a drug that potentially we could repurpose, we could use also to arrest some of the pathogenic processes in progressive MS. And the third uh, component of our program was to go a little bit beyond and say, to take those new insights we got by studying the innate response in the brain, to identify what controls it, right? And then try to design new drugs to target it. And that's kind of one of the, uh, and, and that would be the third component of our, uh, of our project. We identified what we call a pathway, right? A target, a molecule that can be, we believe if, if, if modulated, could be able to control this pathogenic innate inflammation. And then we were able to select and optimize a small molecule, a drug basically, specifically targeted for it. And, that, and that's kind of uh, one of the challenges we're addressing these days, how to make that molecule or a family of molecules derived from that original one good enough to be able to bring it into the clinic. Great, and, and, and so one of the uh, big advantages of repurposing a, a drug that's already used in humans is the speed at which one could get, test that and potentially get, at, you know, have approved as a treatment for MS in humans. That would be one of the big advantages for repurposing, uh, repositioning an existing drug. And then uh, th that process helps sort of inform you and reveal insights that could yield improved you know, that more effective, more safer versions of that drug, or even lead you down a completely other pathways that reveal new insights into, into progressive MS and new treatments for progressive MS. That's exactly right. The idea would be to have something that is closer to the clinic yeah. while we are able to optimize and, 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 and make what would be the second uh, generation available. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Dr. Quintana. I'm going to Turn to now to Dr. San Marco. Uh, um, I I know that you're. We shared before that you're focused on that interaction between the uh, the nervous system and the gut microbiota or the 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 bacteria that live in our digestive system. So can you kind of give us uh, uh, sort of explain what you're going for with your research and what progress you've made with your research? Yeah, we found that the gut microbiota can license specific cell populations, and these cell populations travel all the way to the meninges. That's a layer that covers the brain. And from there, it can talk to astrocytes, then, then Mike is going to introduce you mm -hmm. to what they are, and induce different anti-inflammatory pathways on these astrocytes. So that's basically what we found. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing to think about, right? That the, the bacteria that live in our digestive system and our gut are, and when uh, Dr. Sin Martin, you said license, sort of meaning they are instructing those cells to migrate to the central nervous system and release factors that are having effects of, of cells that reside within the central nervous system, which is, I mean, that was, that's truly fascinating and interesting uh, you know, and could, so, so that one of the, so the, the food we eat, uh, our lifestyle can alter our gut microbiota to some degree, and maybe in turn could alter those cells and how they behave. And, and, and could we leverage that knowledge potentially to develop treatments that could hopefully reduce the impact of progressive MS? Exactly. That's our next step is to understand which microorganisms, because they are like millions on the gut, yeah. we need to understand which one and what they are producing in order to be able to modulate this and um, generate potential yeah. targets, more therapeutic targets for that. Well, it's, it's a, a congratulations on, on some of the discoveries you made there. I think it's really been a very paradigm shifting um, you know, and, and to actually prove that that there's a connection between the bacteria in our in our digestive system and activi activity of cells in the central nervous system has really been pretty, you know, game changing. So congratulations uh, uh, on that. Um, I'm going to shift. We keep uh, we we built you up a lot. Dr. Wheeler is going <laughs> to tell us a lot about astrocytes, among other things. So um, so. 
you're a neuroimmunologist, uh, Dr. Wheeler. So maybe let's start with that. I mean, what, what is a neuroimmunologist and, and um, you know, what, what have you been focused on? Yeah, so I think what's exciting is, you know, all of us are neuroimmunologists here on the panel, but we come at it from different angles. And I think that kind of speaks to what it sort of requires from scientists. So it requires kind of a diverse understanding of um, both multiple different fields that usually don't talk to each other. Um, but kind of what we've built, what we have in the lab is, um, you know, a huge collection of people that speak um, you know, the language of the brain and the language of the immune system to kind of bring it together to figure out how everything's working um, in progressive MS. Okay, so what are astrocytes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so our favorite cell. So astrocytes uh, are, are kind of the, you know, the neuroimmunologists of the CNS in a way, because what they are, they're actually support cells in the nervous system that contact blood vessels um, that Lily was mentioning. Um, so they have access to the immune system, but they also intimately contact every other cell in the nervous system, including neurons and the myelinating cells. Um, so in that sense, they can be thought of as integrating all of these um, very unique inputs. And so that's why we're very interested in targeting them therapeutically. And, and for our, uh, for our uh, participants today, that uh, it, it's interesting or maybe easy to remember astrocytes. So astro is... These are star-shaped cells, so that's where the term comes from. Uh, astro for star, so astrocyte. Um, so that that could be, I think, pretty easy for people to remember. Uh, and when you see them under a microscope, you can see why they're called astrocytes. Um, so thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, so you, you're you you've worked um, with Dr. San Marco and and this sort of communication between cells that come out of the out of the gut and are licensed or educated by the microbiome and are interacting with and altering the function of astrocytes. Could you just kind of tell us a little bit more about that and how that might reveal insights that uh, that uh, of pathways that are driving progressive MS and might reveal targets for therapy? Yeah, so so one of the interesting things we found was um, specifically an immune mechanism that triggers um, a negative inflammatory response in astrocytes. And the way it did this um, was by locking into place kind of a, a pathogenic program, if you will, um, that we found was established by specific more permanent marks. Um, and so we're interested in following this up because um, there are drugs that could target this um, pathway. Um, and so the work with Lilly showed um, that we can also induce um, another response in astrocytes, which is promote their killing or, or inhibiting of the immune response. And, and so I'm going to go off script a little bit, you guys. So I know I'm going to, I'm going to make you a little nervous, but uh, um, so there are other cells within the central nervous system that astrocytes are interacting with. So one, and I'm, I, the cell I'm thinking about are microglial cells. So I don't, I'm going to, uh, maybe if, uh, Dr. Quintana, I'll throw this to you. I mean, could you help our, our viewers sort of uh, understand this interaction between the gut microbiome and astrocytes and the interaction between astrocytes and this other innate immune cell that's in the nervous system, the microglial cell, and how, we're, how those pathways are revealing insights about progressive MS and could yield treatments for progressive MS. So that's an excellent question. So we think, uh, so we're talking about astrocytes, right? These star-shaped cells. So on the one hand, you know, they get signals from the periphery, right? They get information, either, you know, products from the gut microbiota or, or, or immune molecules. But next, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is, as you say, you know, they are very close, in, in very close contact with microglia, which is a type of immune cell that sits, sits in the CNS. So they communicate all the time, they exchange information, and obviously they, what we call, they co-regulate their responses. So the question and one of the biggest challenges in the field is to try to understand what is the language they speak, right? What are the pieces of information in exchange? Because from a very uh, mechanistic point of view, those are kind of like the pieces of information we can target with drugs, right? So um, one of the things we discovered a few years back is that actually the gut flora, right? The microbiome, the intestinal microbiome can send signals, right? that act not only in astrocytes or astrocytes, but also signals that control how these two cells talk to each other. And that was very interesting. Uh, 
But still that didn't tell us all the information. They didn't give us all the information about how they talk to each other. So that's literally, it, it was one of the big questions we tried to address. And literally uh, we just completed a series of studies. We, to cut it short, we developed a new method that allows us a technique that allows us to really decode that information. And that allows us to identify what we believe are new therapeutic targets. So what you brought up is a very important point. Instead of only focusing on specific cells, right, as, as new, as targets of new therapies, can we actually take it to the next level and try to understand how those cells talk to each other as a way of developing more uh, efficient therapies? And the reason for that is because these cells decide what to do by talking to each other. They amplify the responses, they repress them. So we believe that being able to understand that communication will allow us to control that innate inflammation you were referring to, and eventually the progression or one of the most important mechanisms of disease progression. Thanks for helping us think about that a little bit, Fran. And, and, and that's also, and I mentioned this at the beginning of, of where some of the overlaps between the neurodegenerative processes that are driving progressive MS are overlapping with some of the neurodegenerative processes that are driving other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and, and, and those cells that both the astrocytes and the microglial cells are activated and sometimes look very similar in those other neurodegenerative diseases that th then they look like in progressive MS. So it, it's important to point out that some of the advances that are being made in understanding pathways that drive neurodegeneration and other diseases are helping inform MS and the work that you all are doing in MS is also helping to inform some of the work that's going on in other neurodegenerative diseases. Would you say that's a fair statement? Yeah, that's actually right. And indeed, uh, on the one hand, one of the things we, we, we are doing is trying to extrapolate what you say is right. Many of these mechanisms of pathogenesis are common to other neurodegenerative diseases. So that's one of the activities we're engaging now trying to see. And indeed, from the work we've done already, we've seen that some of these mechanisms we found are relevant, just to give you two examples. First of all, for brain tumors, right? And how they can control inflammation in the brain. And also on how uh, some viruses, for example, like Zika virus can induce neurodegeneration. Those mm. are clear examples of how the work we initiated and, 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 and ran in coordination with the Alliance also shed light on other very important uh, pathologies associated to the brain. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, we're, we're starting to get towards the end of our time. I want to ask each of you one more question. And, and we, we've learned, I think we've learned a lot in a short amount of time today. We've learned about how some of the sort of repurposed drug candidates you're working on could uh, address uh, some of the unmet needs for treatments for progressive MS. We've learned about some of the novel approaches that your, and your lab is taking to try to solve the problem of progressive MS. Uh, and, but I, what I'd like to hear from you in the last few minutes is, you know, where do you think your research is gonna go next? Um, the ultimate goal is to, 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 to reveal insights around progressive MS that will yield ultimately new uh, uh, perspectives and new treatments for MS. So I'm gonna start with you, Dr. San Marco. You know, where, where do you see your research going in the next few years? Well, the idea, at least for me, is to understand well which specific um, microorganism is triggering this pathway mm -hmm. that we described, and in order to target that, if we can like increase the this like trigger this mechanism that is limiting inflammation, that would be my goal and my next step. That, and so something that some approach that would alter the microbiome in a way that would reduce the inflammation uh, or, or activity in the central nervous system and provide some therapeutic benefit for people with MS. That's great. So uh, Dr. Wheeler, um, I'm gonna, so what's, what's next for you? What's your, what's, what, what do you, where do you see your research going in the next couple of years? Yeah, so what I think is really exciting is uh, what Fran alluded to, which is attempting to identify how cells interact um, and the mechanisms that control those interactions in the case of a transition from more of an inflammatory state of disease to more of a neurodegenerative state. 
Um, and so that's kind of what I'm interested in, in dissecting in the near future. Excellent. And so I'll leave it to you, Dr. Quintana, to sort of pull everything together. What, 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 do, you, what do you think needs to happen in the next few years for us to have some new effective therapies for progressive MS? So what I think is that we're starting and we have identified what we believe are dominant, important mechanisms, right? And we've been able to uh, bring down to practice in the, same, in the sense of identifying some of them, some of them approved, right? Molecules that can target these pathways or some of them are what we call lead molecules. So I think what we need to do as a community or at least the goal of the lab is now look, so to take those molecules, to take those leads and finalize their development so they can take, be taken up and tested. Uh, I think that's, that's a real goal uh, to, to, because that will have a significant impact on the disease. That, that's, that, that sounds great. And I know the uh, Progressive MS Alliance is also working on a number. We've, we're just revealing one part of the research the alliance's funding in our 30 minutes today, which is rapidly coming to, to an end. But uh, the Alliance is focused in a number of other areas that are advancing progress towards treatments with MS. And Dr. Quintana, this idea of having a clear pathway, uh, 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 um, identifying novel clinical trial designs that can accelerate uh, uh, investigations and new therapies for progressive MS is another area that the Progressive MS Alliance is focused on, which may, I assume, be a part of another uh, webcast in the near future. So uh, we're, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. I hope this time together has helped everyone really see that we, we have the best people in the world working to find solutions to the challenges of, uh, for people that are living with a, 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 a progressive MS. And that the, the International Progressive MS Alliance is really is rallying the worldwide MS community and fueling important research to get effective treatments to people who need them. And, and the Alliance really continues to inspire hope and make progress. Uh, and, and with all that being said, we still, we still need to do more to end progressive MS. So thank you to our panelists, uh, Professor Quintana, Dr. San Marco, Dr. Wheeler. Thanks to all of you for watching us today. Please stay connected to the Alliance through our regular webcast, through your local MS organizations, and please share the work of the Alliance with others. We need everyone to be part of this movement. And together we are stronger than progressive MS.